Uh, Craig Blair is with us here. And Craig, before you get into the financial numbers, yesterday, House Majority Leader Eric Householder said that we could have four different governors between January the 3rd and January the whatever it was. And he mentioned that you would be one of those folks if certain dominoes fell. Governor Justice would have to swear in uh, before uh, January the, whenever the new governor, 3rd, 3rd, January 3, Colin says. And that would make you the governor for the next 10 days, I think it was. Something like that, yes. Yeah. Uh, any in- insight on this? No. <laughs> hey, listen, I have an, I- I have an idea. No. <laughs> but then you would be out. When do you? When does your term end? My term will end of on the second Wednesday of January. Okay. So that's t- t- until then. And if you're still you, seven if, months of work, if you're and if your term ended, then there would be whoever. The, he said the next Senate president would be governor for a few days until the newest governor is then sworn in. It'd be four governors like in ten or twelve days. Yeah, on that Wednesday, then it follows to of the first Monday. Uh, or excuse me, the the following Monday is okay. my understanding. Go ahead, John. So during that slice of time when you're governor, I don't want to you know overstretch here, but I think that West Virginia needs a novelist laureate. So in that slice of time, if you just make that appointment, I I you know I'd, I'd be really grateful. Should, I don't want to overextend, but you know just throw that out as a thought. Can we get the business here? <laughs> shameless, <laughs> totally shameless. Yeah. How the, about a prosecutor laureate? <laughs> Is there such a thing? Craig, the numbers for May, uh, again, uh, above uh, estimates, and you've got one month left, and you're on a pace somewhere around $800 million for year-to-date uh, surplus. As I predicted 11 months ago mm-hmm. of on where we would be at. It's not hard to calculate some of this up. Of where we're at right now, uh, for, uh, for this fiscal year, we've exceeded our revenue estimates by $701 million. Of last month, we exceeded the revenue estimates by $63 million of to, to the general revenue fund. Now, when we were in the special session here, what was it, two weeks ago, mm-hmm. the governor increased the revenue estimates. So it drives these numbers down, but I work off the old numbers. When uh, the governor increased the revenue estimates, it was so that we could actually transfer some monies around. $150 million went to the road fund, $50 million to an ag lab, that will be at West Virginia State University, $27 million to, uh, additional money going into the Hope Scholarship, $10 million to Posey Perry. Now, there were some other things that was out there. What's Posey Perry? Posey Perry is a food bank uh, okay. of, that's out there. And so that was something that the governor's very interested in, and it's like, you know, he's the executive, so you're able to, to do these things. And we all work together down there. That's how we get to where we're at here today of in the state of West Virginia. When we come into the personal income tax collections, last month they exceeded the uh, revenue estimates by $17.7 million. Uh, for the year, it's $183 million above the revenue estimates. Severance tax of uh, was eight and a half million dollars above revenue estimates and for the year fifth almost 59 million dollars above the revenue estimates for the year this makes for terrible radio so i apologize to the listeners but uh, i don't know how to do it any better than to no you're fine to talk the numbers out got to have the numbers and in and, and these things that i read off whether it's the personal income tax of uh, the severance tax the consumer sales tax these things are all economy indicators it gives you an idea on where things are going in the state of West Virginia so for the consumer uh, sales and use tax we were 13.7 million dollars above revenue estimates so for the year we've exceeded that by 34.3 million dollars of for the year Uh, then let's get ready and talk about lotteries just for a second lottery is running totally about $67 million above the revenue estimates for the year. The road fund is treading water where it shows that we're $195 million of, but a lot of it's got to do with the federal reimbursements. We're doing a good job of drawing down matching dollars when it comes to doing uh, federal reimbursements. Switching over to the rainy day fund. Of last month, we were $1.23 billion. $1.23 billion in our rainy day fund. 
to give a perspective on that. That was actually down on about $40 million from the previous month. But that, that fluctuates up and down because of investment returns. Uh, on it. But if you t put it in comparison to last year, of $949 million is what it was last year. So we're about mm, $300 million above what we were last year. And keep in mind also that we've got about $500 million setting into the personal income tax reserve fund. Uh, and so if you factored that in, we'd have one of the best rainy day funds there is in the country. Here's a question for you. When the rainy day fund earns investment returns, whether that's interest or whatever, are there federal taxes on that? No, it's, it's government. So there's no taxes involved in that. So it just the, the interest just rolls back and keeps compounding. Can I uh, add some of my own personal savings into the rainy day fund to take advantage of that? No. I gave it a shot, Gilstrap. I know. Yeah, and uh, they're, they're very good about getting the returns on investment. A couple years ago, uh, we actually changed the statute of, to allow uh, the development, Berkeley County's Development Authority, that had substantial revenues because of the sale of property to Procter & Gamble. And when they did that, they wanted to be able to invest just like the state of West Virginia. So we allowed for that to happen. Mm -hmm. And they're getting a good return on investment for that. And we've looked at of uh, being able to allow others to go and do that as well. So of the $300 million difference in the rainy day fund, how much of that is actually from good investments as opposed to fresh money? It's good investments and fresh money. Uh, the, the, I can't, I, I don't have that in front of me. We transferred to the rainy day fund last year. I forget the number on that. It's probably in the 120, 150 million dollar okay. range. Okay, so about half. Yeah, and s Riley Moore, I think, would probably have that information as the treasurer, would he not? Well, he probably does. I should have it. I just don't remember it. That's fine. Uh, because it's, it takes an act of the legislature to be able to transfer those monies around to start with. <laughs> Uh, in there now to, on the interest side of it if I knew the other number I could tell you what we've got and again remember that's a roller coaster right uh, they can go up and down but long term the stock and market investments may be different let me give you a little bit of history on this, this is back in the early 90s I think it was no excuse me early 2000s we had a constitutional amendment that actually made it so that West Virginia could actually invest in the stock market. At that point in time, we could not. Before that, we could not. And it had to take a vote of the people to be able to do that. Was, uh, that, was that due to A. James Mansion? That was a component of it, yes. Uh, so we could only do treasuries and stocks, or excuse me, bonds. We weren't allowed to invest into the stock market. And that has done a lot to be able to help us ourselves out and it's also helped our pension funds keep in mind that back in what i think it was 1992 our pensions were six percent funded i'll come back to the corporate net here in a second let's talk about the pensions because these are all things that businesses look at when they're thinking about locating into a state are we going to be taxed for sins of the past that is something it's always looked at of uh, the PERS the public employees retirement system is 97.6 percent funded of uh, the teachers retirement uh, the teachers defined benefit one is 79.9 percent .9 funded and keep in mind that anything that's 80 percent funded is fully funded if you're 100 percent funded that means everybody in the system could actually retire and actually have their money you put that in contrast with Illinois <laughs> <laughs> so West Virginia looks very, very good from that standpoint. State police is 95.9% funded. Uh, the, there's the A and B for that. Um, the B funds 84.8. The judges are 228% funded. So Matt, when you make that big move to being a judge, I won't. You, you're going never to say have, never. You're going to have one of the best retirement <laughs> systems there is out there. You know, I heard Charlie Trump say that one time too. <laughs> And uh, he's going to make a great addition to the court. Absolutely. Uh, the deputy sheriff's one is 87.7% funded. Emergency medical services, 103%. Municipal police and firefighters, 133% funded. Natural resource so police officers, 81% funded. If you're funded. overfunded, does that mean you can cut back on the contributions to bring it back down to what's 100%? That would take an act of the legislature to be able to change that of otherwise, because I've made that argument for the judges' system. 
uh, and you can't transfer them from one fund to another. I would love it, now to keep in mind that the judges, the number on that of uh, the, what they have in there is significantly less because there's judges, but compared to what they need, it's over 200% funded. So, but we can. We, what we, happens can't, the extra we money? can't change anything unless we change the statutory requirements. All right. So, but if you're 200 plus percent funded, then what do you do with the extra 100 percent of money? It sets there. Just earning more it, money? It sets there. I'd love to be able to sweep it, to be quite honest with you, <laughs> and, and move it over to the teacher's retirement to, sure. off to where it would be better. But that that is their fund that is managed. And so I guess in a way, I shouldn't have said that I'd love to sweep it, but ideally... Uh, if you were able to manipulate them around so that you kept everybody 100% funded, the better off you are. Now, let me hit them one other thing, sure. and then you can hit me with questions. And that's the corporate net. And that is th that corporate net tax is very, very important to be paying attention to because we've reduced that over the years. But right now, it's for the year at this point in time. It's raised $402 million. It's $226 million dollars above the revenue estimates. Ladies and gentlemen, that's a big deal. It's a really, really big deal. And it, what it means is that businesses are profitable again. And if businesses can be profitable in the state of West Virginia, that means that they can grow, they can expand, they can hire more employees, they do more investment. That's huge. And that it makes it so that we are attractive to business as well. Uh, so I wanted to share get that one out on the table as well because that's that one I pay a lot of attention to along with the personal income tax if you see personal income tax dropping down then that's a problem in the same way with the uh, consumer sales tax when you see that drop down that it can be a problem also you're talking about the collections not the percentage right when you're yeah, th th we're talking about the collections yeah we're talking about the collections. uh and but it gives you an indicator where your economy's gone and what could be actually moving into the future mm -hmm. on that so excuse me someone someone's calling you do you need to take that nope yeah so that's where we're at of in the state of West Virginia for right now. You know this guy now, who just came in to sit down to your left? Yeah, I do. You met with good morning, twice. Congressman. Good to see you, buddy. <laughs> Alex Moody just, just dropped in. Alex, good morning to you. Good morning. Yeah, I'll be with you in a second. All right. Yeah. Uh, so uh, you uh, have any other numbers you needed to address, Chris? No, no. I've got all the numbers out. That are t There's lots of other numbers, but they get boring. And I know what I just talked about on the radio mm -hmm. is boring, except for the work that we've done since the Republicans taken over in the state of West Virginia. We come in where we had shortfalls. We had to, the governor wanted to, uh, Governor Justice in his first year, wanted to do a $500 million tax increase. And we said no. And then we realized that, wait a minute, we can control the growth of government. And I'll take a victory lap on this. The flatline budget, I know that I sound like a broken record when I talk about that. Uh, but the bottom line is, is that we didn't cut spending. What we did was controlled our spending and let the revenues grow. And then we keep the revenue estimates down. I get beat on all the time for artificially low revenue estimates. Well, this makes sense. Why would, if I made $60,000 a year, why would I predict in this upcoming year that I'm going to make 70 and then I spend up to 70 and then when I get to the last two months of the year, I say, wait a minute, I'm $10,000 short. That's the way we used to run government. Mm -hmm. For God's sake, when Jack Whitaker won the Powerball, we were hoping and praying that we'd be able to plug the hole in our budget by somebody in West Virginia winning the Powerball. They did, and they plugged the hole in the budget on that. But that's got to be the damn dumbest idea that I've ever heard for being able to manage government, mm -hmm. period. And so I watched that, and so that was the way it's like cutting government is impossible. Uh, Alex, you can attest to that uh, because of de dealing with them on the federal government. you got to be able to get the votes to it. But if you never increase your spends and you hold them flat, that squeezes out efficiencies. And when you squeeze those efficiencies out and you're having your revenues grow, then you can reinvest in yourself and you can see that. You can see it on what we've done with the pay raises on the roads of tax relief, largest tax relief in state history. Uh, to the people of West Virginia, 21.25% in the personal property tax on automobiles and if you have uh, equipment machinery, if you're a million dollars or less. Those are all big deals. John? So the 
Senate president, incoming Senate president, when that's decided when January, February coming in, um, likely not going to be from the Eastern Panhandle. It won't be from the Eastern Panhandle. It won't be from the Eastern Panhandle. What do residents of the Eastern Panhandle lose as a result? Uh, as a practical matter, political matter, um, it's... The Eastern Panhandle has taken a huge hit of over the, this last election A lot cycle. of leadership. Yeah, correct. Uh, John Hardy was a phenomenal delegate down there. Eric Householder, uh, the majority leader, is, didn't run again and is not down there now. And, of course, uh, losing the Senate president is not a good thing either. But, uh, you know, it is what it is. Charlie voters, Trump was judiciary chair? D- yes, Paul Charlie Trump. Paul Espinosa. Paul Espinosa. <laughs> Forgive me for not going the rest of the way <laughs> on that. Yeah. Uh, but, but uh, yes, the but but a lot of this is self determination. Charlie moves over to the Supreme Court. Paul wanted to be a senator. Uh, John is out to run for Berkeley County Commission. So it, it's not all of this was done by the voters. Yeah. A lot of this was done voluntarily. But okay. I mean, as I, I, it, it, Eric wanted to be the auditor. But but from the citizens' point of view, how does that manifest itself? I mean, how would life, if, if the, all of that shifts over to the northern panhandle, uh, some other part of the state, and the, and the strong leadership goes there, what do we lose that, that shifts over in that direction? Do I mean, as a practical matter, what, what shifts for people who live here? I can't tell you what is lost for the eastern panhandle. What I can tell you is what's lost for the state. Uh, of, is that me? That was me. Of the, 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 what's lost for the state is... We have growth in the Eastern Panhandle. We have a strong economy. And one of the things that, uh, under my leadership, is that we want, I wanted to make other growth areas in the state of West Virginia, be able to lift up the people. That way we keep more of our resources at home. And it worked from that standpoint. Of the, There's been a long history in the state of West Virginia that whenever you become the Senate president of, or you had any type of power at all, then you gobbled up all the money that you possibly could, scraped it off the table, and you took it to your district. That is not the way that we were operating down there, and I'm hoping that that doesn't happen into the future as well. But I can't predict that of on, on what's taking place. It all depends on what goes on. Of the way government was run is lost too, of because of the fact that there is a, clearly a divided caucus right now, of and they're all scrambling to trying to figure out. With the vacuum of me not being the Senate president in coming January, I was the one that was able to bridge of uh, the different groups together and say, here's what we should be focusing on. Here's how we should be managing it. But most importantly, I kept them aware of the issues, put everything on the table every morning, either at 7.30 or 8.30 in the morning. We'd spend an hour, hour and a half together going over those issues so that everybody throughout the state, no matter where you were from, had an understanding of the different perspectives. And then we would make a collective decision like a board of directors. It was not where the Senate president dictated it out. You know, I've got some members that think that if you are the Senate president, you get to tell everybody else what to do. Well, that's been done in the past, and it's also failed the people of West Virginia in the past. You don't want to do that. You want to operate like a board of directors. Matt Harvey. Oh, gosh. Um, Craig, so do you, do you think that this economic wave that West Virginia is experiencing will continue into the future? Uh, it has the potential to continue to the future. This will be up to the legislature and the executive and the decisions that they make. Uh, and so, uh, the, look, the foundation's been laid. Uh, a roadmap has been created of to be to have an understanding of what the right things are to do, what the wrong things are to do. Um, there are, there's still much more to do, though. And over the next seven months, that's one of the things I'm actually doing. We're, we're working with uh, Governor John Kasich of, out of Ohio, creating Jobs West Virginia. Uh, we haven't named it yet, but we're well on the path. Uh, that was a very, very successful program that John Kasich uh, created back before it was in the process before he was elected governor in 2012 in Ohio. And I've gotten to be friends with Governor Kasich and of. Uh, we are working in West Virginia to be able to put that forward, get the legislature out of the economic development business in the state of West Virginia, and get the right people in. Uh, the 
phase two, three, and four of the DHHR reorg is a big, big deal. There's another 100 to $200 million of savings of that can be managed in a way that the people get the results they need. West Virginia needs to be a digital state for that matter so that we can actually communicate whether it's from workforce to our education systems to the DHHR and be able to keep people in the workforce, keep them employed, and keep them educated. That's the next thing that we got to... The world is changing around us, and we need to be able to leapfrog, not just gravitate forward. We've always been last uh, in a, a lot of these categories because we waited till what the other states did before we did anything. We have technology changes that are taking place as we're seated here right now, like artificial intelligence. That is going to be game changers, well, disruptors. That's a better way of putting it, being a disruptor. Quantum computing is another one that is going to be disruptors. And we need to be able to have the vision, our legislature and our executive needs to have the vision to be able to see into the future and be able to make the right decisions for the people of West Virginia so that we're not in the doldrums. And over the last uh, four, six, eight, ten years, we've been doing just that. But we've also been learning how to lead as well. And so I hope I answered your question. You did, yeah. yeah. Greg, we're going to take a commercial break here. Uh, do you want to hang out with us for another half hour? You can also interview Alex. <laughs> you want me to hey, stay? Yeah, hang out. That might make I'll for some interesting questions, right? I'll stay. Huh. Hey, we're back with uh, Representative Alex Mooney, as you uh, may have seen on our TV side, is in Studio 2, giving you a little wave there. We stop here. We're back with uh, Alex, and uh, Craig will hang around, too. 